Hello, everybody. Welcome to the RPA Vanguard channel. My name is Andy Menon. In this video, we are going to be talking about running Docker containers in persistent mode. And in that process, we are going to touch upon the concepts of Docker bind mounts and volumes. As we are in the vicinity, we'll also be looking at how to lightly customize our UiPath Docker containers. Before we begin, I would highly recommend watching the previous videos in the series so that there is clarity on the subjects that are being covered uh, in this video. So with that, let's get started. So we are on the UiPath Linux robots documentation page. And when we ran our first uh, Linux automation as covered in the previous videos, we used this command line here. So if I copy this command line and switch to notepad and split that, into multiple lines, uh, this is how it looks like, right? And if you recall from the previous videos, we also ran uh, a UiPath container and also executed an automation, right? And in that process, we saw a lot, uh, many log lines uh, being rendered uh, into this interface here, right? Now, this is a Docker run command at its simplest, right? If we run a Docker container with this command, uh, you will see logs being streamed to this interface. But the problem is that all of these logs will not persist once your Docker container is shut down, right? Uh, practically speaking, we are required to persist information when running our process flows, regardless of what platform or technology that is used to build these processes. And running UiPath Linux robots uh, in Docker containers is no exception. Now, uh, the counter argument to persisting logs after shutting down uh, our Docker containers uh, is you can argue saying, hey, I'm going to keep all my logs in the orchestrator. That, that's correct. But you must realize that the resources of the cloud orchestrator or uh, the on-premise orchestrator database are not infinite, right? Someday you will have to uh, do some maintenance and you have to constantly backup logs. So persisting uh, logs to the uh, Docker host system, uh, whether it's a Windows host system or a Linux host system, uh, gives you another alternative to store these logs uh, for backup and further analysis, right? This leads us to the second uh, command line uh, in the documentation. And we can see that here. Now, if I do the same thing, if I copy this command and then switch over uh, and split that uh, to multiple lines. This is how it's going to look like. And if you compare uh, the these two command lines, uh, you can see that there is an additional V switch here. This is the additional line uh, that you do not see uh, in the simple Docker run command, right? And obviously, if you look at the UiPath documentation, you can run this command by simply understanding that, hey, I'm going to back up all my logs from the Docker container to my, uh, you know, Windows or Linux host system, right? But if you just stop at that, you're missing a lot because the additional parameter that you see in this command, this here, right? The V switch uh, is significant because it is indicative of a couple of very important features of Docker containers. And uh, these features are named uh, Docker bind mounts and Docker volumes, right? And this line here, if I isolate it, this line is a definition of a Docker bind mount, right? This is a definition of Docker bind mount, right? And the other feature uh, that I spoke about is the volumes and that supersedes bind mounts as it offers better features when compared to bind mounts. And we'll get into the differences in a few, but in this video, we are gonna be focusing on Docker bind mounts, given that it has been adopted for use in the official UiPath documentation. And it is important for us to understand, at least in the context of running UiPath Linux robots in Docker containers, right? So with that, let's get into the Docker bind mounts a bit. Okay, so now we are on the Docker documentation page for bind mounts and volumes. So what you have here is the host. Uh, 
right? This is the host machine. It can be either a Windows machine or a Linux machine. And then you have the Docker container, right? We saw how we created a Docker container and ran it. Now, up until now, uh, the Docker container executed with the help of this temporary mount, right? This temporary mount, you see that tempfs bound. So what the Docker container did was it carved out a place in memory, right? And then um, it did all of its, uh, you know, IOs or whatever uh, functions it had to do when the container was actively running. And once the container was shut down, this area of memory was removed. And this is why it's called uh, a temp file system mount. So once the container is destroyed, then the temp FS disappears, right? Now coming to the left side of this uh, graphic here, uh, you see an arrow going in and this is a volume, a Docker volume. And this here is a Docker bind mount. Now, uh, sometimes it might be confusing to understand what this is. So I'm going to explain this with an example. Let me start with the volume first. Now you can see that this orange box here is your host file system. This is your physical disk, right? And when you create a volume uh, in Docker, what Docker does is it carves out a separate area within your file system, right? And the real world example for this is a food truck, right? Now a food truck uh, is a restaurant uh, on wheels, right? And it will be parked in a certain area of your city or town. And then uh, the food truck will have its own rules for uh, you know, ordering the food and then paying for the food and getting rid of your dishes once you're done. And some of these food trucks are uh, pretty, uh, pretty advanced. Uh, they also have seating areas, right? But that whole food truck business is something that is self-contained, right? So a Docker volume is something like that, right? Docker cows out an area in your file system and it regulates everything going in and out of that volume. Now, this is just like the food truck is very flexible. What happens is tomorrow the food truck and the restaurant business can move and they can move to another town or another city and they can set up shop there and they can run their business just like uh, they did in other areas, right? Uh, that is what uh, Docker volumes are. They are very flexible and uh, to an extent they isolate you from what the host system is because it runs equally well on the Windows host or the Linux host, right? And it can be moved from one host to the other uh, with, um, uh, with, with certain amount of flexibility, right? So this is basically what a volume is, right? Uh, this is a very flexible uh, feature that supersedes bind mounts, right? But then what's a bind mount, right? If you look at this, the bind mount arrow leads directly to this file system box. The bind mount is an older feature, but what the bind mount does is you are actually taking a specific area of your file system, a specific path to a folder, and you are mapping it to your Docker container, right? That means Docker has to know the exact path to your local file system. And this is a tight binding, right? This is a very rigid binding. And a bind mount in the real world is like having a restaurant inside a mall, right? The restaurant is located in a certain place. It is located uh, at a specific address. So people know where to go. People know where to sit. Everything is absolute and everything is bound rigidly, right? And for that very same reason, uh, the restaurant owner in the mall simply cannot wrap up everything and move to another corner of the mall. It's not going to be possible, right? So a bind mount is a more rigid binding uh, from your local file system to your Docker container file system. Right? And for that very same reason, bind mounts are more performant. They're much more efficient because everything is absolute. You know where it is, you know where to go, and you know what to do, right? So <clears throat> this is the fundamental difference between volume and bind mount, right? And now let's go back to the command uh, that is used uh, to run um, or create volumes of bind mounts, right? So I'm going to go back to the text editor. Now, both uh, volumes or bind mounts can be created using 
the V switch or the volume switch or what you call as volume or what you call as the mount switch. Now, uh, the difference is that this version, the underscore V is concise, but uh, you have to give the attributes in a specific order. You cannot randomly space or randomly order your attributes. It has to be specific, otherwise it's gonna fail. But it is concise, it is easy, and uh, it's a lot easier to use and understand, right? The mount on the other hand is much more verbose, right? It's much more verbose. And there is no specific order in which you can define the attributes, right? You can define the attributes in any order. But another significant difference between the V switch and the mount is that in a V switch, if the local file path on your host system does not exist, it will be created for you when Docker container starts, right? But when using the mount switch, the local path on your host system must already exist. If it does not already exist, then it's gonna fail, right? So that makes the V switch very attractive in terms of usage because it is short, it is concise, right? And it is also very convenient. That is why uh, we are going to be using the V switch when we run our Docker containers uh, in persistent mode later in this video, right? Now comes volumes. Volumes in itself is a very large subject. So therefore, um, I would recommend that you look up the documentation on volumes once you have an understanding of bind mounts. And as I said earlier at the beginning of this video, once you understand volumes, uh, you can always repurpose your Docker containers to run with volumes instead of bind mounts, right? But since the bind mounts have been used in the UiPath documentation, uh, we will be using uh, bind mounts in this video so that you can get an initial understanding of what it means to run a Docker container in persistent mode, right? So with that out of the way, let's see how the bind mount switch is applied as far as uh, UiPath Linux containers are concerned. All right, so we are back uh, to the uh, Docker interface here, Docker desktop for Windows. And I would like to draw your attention to this uh, container that's already running. Uh, if you have watched the previous videos, then this container must be familiar to you by now. But uh, let me quickly uh, inspect uh, this, uh, this container. If I go in here and if I go to inspect, uh, observe that you have a certain number of parameters here. And uh, the last line that you see is the .NET version uh, that this container is running, right? Now let's step back and look at this container here. This is YouTube demo two, and I'm going to similarly inspect this container here. And if I inspect this container, you will see that it has an additional parameter or attribute called mounts. And if I copy this, and if I paste this here, what this mount command is essentially telling Docker is that a bind mount has to be mapped onto the host file system and the absolute path to that uh, file system folder is as follows, right? C colon uses public Debian logs, right? And what you're seeing in essence is the implementation of this generic V switch. Remember, uh, V switch has to have the attributes in a specific order. And here the order is the absolute path to the host file system and the path to the Docker container, right? File system. And uh, we are going to ignore the options for now because it is not very relevant to this discussion. But if you ignore the options, this is how an implemented version of the V switch looks like, right? You're taking this path 
SQL and uses public Debian logs, and you are mapping it to the location of the UiPath logs in the UiPath Linux container. Remember, the second path here is by design provided by the UiPath Docker image, right? This is the path in the Alpine Linux file system, right? And now what you're doing is you are mapping or binding your file system, your host file system with a specific location in the UiPath Linux container. And remember, in this case, we are trying to persist the logs from this location to a certain location on our file system. And that is why we are mapping it to root local share UiPath logs, right? So uh, we can take a look at this by inspecting our container, right? So I'm going to copy this and get into this container. Remember, I'm in YouTube demo two, which is the uh, container that has a bind mount, and I'm going to get into the command line. So in the command line, I'm going to say CD and paste the path. And I am at this uh, location. And if I do ls-l, you can see the UiPath execution logs in this container, right? Now, let me go back to the other side. Let me go to the Windows host system and take a look at the path or the file path that's been mapped in the local host. So I'm going to copy this and get into this folder here. I'm going to expand this. <clears throat> and if I paste that, you can see that this is the very same uh, set of files that you see inside the Alpine Linux container, right? Here are all the logs and here are some of the files that were specifically created. Uh, these are not logs. I just created them as an example, right? Now I'm going to do the same thing. Uh, what I'll be doing is I'll be creating a file in Windows, right? I'm going to create a new file here in Windows and I'm going to see what happens uh, within the uh, Linux container. And then I'm going to modify that file in Linux and see what happens here. So I'm going to go into Windows here and I'm going to create a new file. And I'm going to modify it. Right. And I'm going to save it. I'm going to close. Now I'm going to come back to the Linux container here. Remember, you're not seeing anything different. So what I'll do is I'm going to do ls l. And this time you're going to see that file here created in Windows 10 host. Now let's take a look at the content of this file, right? I'm going to go back and say cat created. And here it is. Uh, this, is uh, this is the content that we typed a minute ago and you can see this right here. Now, uh, what if I want to modify this file, right? Uh, what if I want to modify this, uh, this file here inside the Linux uh, file system? Now, uh, remember uh, UiPath Linux containers are built using Alpine Linux. And uh, one of the things about Alpine Linux is that it is meant or it was created uh, with uh, security in mind. And therefore uh, the Alpine Linux distribution is extremely lean. It doesn't even come with a text editor. Now, if you compare that to something that is more ubiquitous like uh, Debian, uh, you will find Debian comes with all kinds of utilities, right? All kinds of basic programs uh, like uh, the text editor. And uh, even if you go online, you will see that there are many more solutions for uh, Debian Linux than there are for Alpine Linux, right? So Alpine Linux is extremely tight. It is uh, meant for secure implementations. And therefore, if you want to customize something, uh, you will have to do that yourself. So in this case, I want to be a little bit, um, let me say, I want to be a bit more productive. Uh, 
And I don't want to be using the cat Linux command to actually create files, right? Instead, uh, we are going to step into customizing uh, the Linux container a bit, right? I'm going to install the nano text editor because nano is a very uh, prolific and ubiquitous text editor. And uh, I use it in Debian all the time. And I want to use it in Alpine Linux as well. Now, what you're going to be looking at is an example of customizing your Docker container, right? And remember, when I customize this, it is going to be applicable only to this container, right? So I have already done that, but I'm going to walk you through the steps. And I'm also going to link the documentation for Alpine Linux uh, in the description so that uh, you can pursue that further. Right, so if I switch to my notes, remember um, APK or is the Alpine Linux package manager. And if you want to fetch the nano package, you run this command APK fetch nano, and then uh, it will download nano. And uh, remember, you have to go to your home folder. Remember root is not your home folder, right? So, and therefore it will download everything to the home folder. So if I go back uh, into the, Linux container, and I'm going to just clear this, and I'm going to say cd home, uh, and I do lsl, and here you can see that the nano package has been downloaded. Now to install nano, you're going to be running this command. Remember, because you have downloaded an external package, uh, you have to give the switch called allow untrusted. And once you do that, it is going to the APK package manager is going to install everything. And then uh, you will have your nano editor installed. Now, what I'm going to do is I am going to open the file uh, that was created in the Windows file system in Linux, and I'm going to append a few lines to it. And then we can go back into the Windows file system and see uh, what the state of that file is right so i'll go back to alpine linux i got to go back and change the file path so what i'm going to do is i'm going to quickly copy that here yeah. l okay i'm going to say nano created now the file is open in nano and what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit enter. And I'm going to say control X and it's going to ask me to save, yes. And I'm going to overwrite the changes, right? Now I'm going to switch back to the Windows host system and I'm going to edit this with notepad and there it is the modifications that we created inside of the linux container have been affected to this file because these two locations are held together using bind mounts and this is how the concept of bind mounts works uh, in docker and using the concept of uh, bind mounts uh, we are able to persist the logs from the Linux, the UiPath Linux container into your Windows host file system, right? So I hope that uh, gives you a bit more clarity on how bind mounts work and also, uh, you know, sort of emphasize what this simple line means. So what we are going to be doing next uh, is we are going to create a new UiPath Linux container from scratch using uh, bind mounts. Right. And then we are going to run an automation. Right. And then we are going to see how those logs are persisted on your Windows host file system. So uh, we are back to Docker desktop for Windows. And uh, just to keep things in focus, what I have done is I have shut down all the containers uh, so that we can focus on the new container that we are going to be creating. And then here is the VNC viewer. And uh, 
uh, this is where I'm going to be accessing my service machine. Uh, remember that uh, uh, from the previous videos and also my other video on uh, UiPath service robots, uh, this is where all my background uh, service automations are actually running. And once we set up our uh, container, uh, we are going to be remoting into this machine and uh, we are going to be running an automation. Uh, and then uh, we are going to take a look at how the logs are going to be persisted uh, in our Windows file system, right? So with that, what we are going to do is we're going to go back into the text editor. I'm going to close this file. And what I've done here is I have created the Docker command uh, for spinning up a new container. Right. And uh, remember, your machine key is basically the uh, key of the uh, template uh, that you created. If you are not familiar with this, please do watch the previous videos on how all of this was set up. And this is my orchestrator URL. And this is the bind mount syntax. Now, remember, when you use the vSwitch, the advantage here is that you do not have to create this folder right? First hand, you don't have to create it. Docker will create this folder for you if it does not already exist, right? So if I go back to this path, C colon uses public, you can see that that folder does not exist. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep this aside and uh, so that we can observe what happens uh, in this file system. And of course, the other path is going to be the path to UiPath robot logs. And of course, this is the image. And this is the same command in a single line. Uh, I'm going to copy this. And I'm going to start a command prompt. And what I'll do is I'm going to paste this here. And I'm going to hit run. And let's observe what happens on the right as this command is executed. There it is. You see that this folder has been created because it does not already exist. And that's the advantage of using the vSwitch. Now, if I go back to Docker desktop, here is a, a container. Now it's got a funny name. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to rename it uh, to something uh, meaningful. Uh, please remember this was all covered in the previous video, but I'm going to the steps nonetheless. Uh, Docker. Docker. Rename. Trusting Kurana to YouTube. persistence demo. That's good. If I now run the listing command again, there it is. The first container has been renamed to YT persistence demo. Okay, that's good. Now, what we have done in a sense, if we go back to the Docker interface, you can see that this uh, container is now renamed. If I inspect this container, we have mapped the, uh, the UiPath logs location to our local file system. And the next step for us is to run our automation, right? So I'm going to remote into my service robot. So, and if you have watched the previous videos, then uh, this uh, particular tenant must be, uh, you know, familiar to you already. Uh, I'm gonna go into the orchestrator and here is Linux automations, uh, go into processes. And I will be running the basic uh, demo automation called Linux Quotes of the Day. Uh, now, please note, uh, this is a new container. So what happens is when I hit the run button, it is going to take several minutes for uh, the container to ramp up before the automation runs because all of the packages that are required must be installed. So if I take a look at the timestamp here, uh, the last timestamp is 8.27 PM here on this, I'm going to pause the recording and I'm going to come back once the automation has executed. So first, uh, let me run this automation. 
there it is it is running and if i go back to docker desktop and get into logs and there it is the the container is ramping up and you can see that it is getting all the packages that it requires and uh, if you recall from the previous videos we covered uh, the uh, logs in detail and uh, please uh, take a look at that section of the previous videos if you're not familiar with what is happening here but for now i'm going to pause the recording and i will uh, see you in a few all right so we are back the automation has run but it has um, completed with a failure but that's not the point here uh, the point here is to not run the automation uh, correctly but uh, to see what information can we persist in the logs right so uh, it took almost about 10 minutes because when we started uh, the timestamp was 8 27 pm but when the automation actually started executing it was about 8 36 uh, pm so almost 9 to 10 minutes and uh, here you can see that uh, it has failed so we are not going to worry about that but what we are going to be looking at is going back to our local host machine and see if the logs are available for us to inspect okay so i'm going to get out of the vnc viewer here and um, here you can see that the automation has failed here it is now this is the bind mount this is where we have bound our uh, file system to the container now here are the execution logs you can see that it is timestamped to 8 36 pm and if you go to internal you can see the ui path robot logs now if i open the robot logs here you can see the entire history of uh, the logs this is uh, and it contains uh, the history of whatever we did uh, with uh, this container uh, when we started executing our automation right and uh, here you can see that the uh, linux automation that we tried to run failed uh, but if we want to actually uh, look at the uh, execution logs i go back to public and then i go back sorry i go back into this and look at this execution um, document so here is the uh, execution file so if i open this here we have uh, the logs that are related to this specific uh, uh, execution of uh, this automation and uh, here is the error. Uh, we have taken the logs that are visible here in this uh, container, right? And uh, if I go into the Linux file system and take a look at the log files, uh, you can find these log files there as well. And what we have done is captured uh, all of that and persisted uh, that information into our local file system. Right. Uh, so for uh, the sake of completeness, uh, let's uh, inspect. Uh, let's go into this container. Now I am in YT persistence demo and open this container here. I'm going to open the command line interface for this container. And here again, you can see the very same files 2022-0404 execution log, as well as the internal, uh, the execution uh, log folders uh, that we are seeing here uh, that have been replicated to our local file system right so this is how uh, we run uipath linux containers in persistent mode So before I conclude this video, I would like to draw your attention to a few more powerful features of uh, Docker bind mounts uh, and or volumes. Uh, although this concept looks very simple, it's very powerful, right? Uh, here we discussed about mapping UiPath uh, logs, robot logs to our local host system, right? But uh, we are not limited to just that, right? Uh, what we can do is we can run containers with multiple bind mounts. So we can not only map 
uh, UiPath uh, robot logs, but we can also map other information from within our Docker container to our host system. So what you see here in front of you is another uh, Docker run command. And in this case, uh, what the Docker run command is doing is it is binding multiple locations on our host system to the Docker file system. In this case, uh, what we are doing is, as usual, we are mapping uh, the logs uh, to the UiPath uh, logs location inside the Alpine Linux container. And in addition to that, uh, we are also mapping a data folder right, to a folder created inside of a uh, uh, customized uh, Linux container. Right? In this case, what I've done is I've created this folder path uh, called home RPA data within my container. And I'm mapping that to a specific location here. I, I think that uh, if you have already realized uh, the, uh, the power of this, because uh, what you can do in a sense is you can build uh, multiple uh, UiPath uh, Linux robot containers, and you can have robots share data between them. You have one robot producing data, and then depositing that data to this location. And then you have another robot uh, running in another uh, Docker container and picking up this file and processing it uh, downstream, right? So uh, this is a very powerful concept, although uh, you know this, this command line is uh, very simple or this V switch is uh, very simple. So uh, that is all for this video. And I hope I have been successful in demonstrating how to run um, UiPath uh, uh, Docker containers in persistent mode, and also uh, demonstrating some of the concepts of bind mounts and also uh, customizing uh, your uh, Linux containers uh, based on your needs. Thank you. And if you like this video, uh, please do like and subscribe to my channel. I'll truly appreciate it. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye.